fine. But in the meantime, there are certain principles, such as possession, which remain fundamental to the operation of the law and land and land titles today. And I want to go through some of those with you in the time still available. So when you go on to this section on one-heaven.org and you get into the purple box, How to Save Your Home, you'll go in and you'll see a whole range of links there and con uh, content. In that you'll see links like land, Tara land, La land and so on. You'll go see the word mortgage, foreclosure. Then you'll see a whole lot of links on tenancy and FAQ. Then you'll see steps, consideration, claim, hearing, judgment. Then you go further down and you'll see right of land, land rights. <clears throat> there are two remedies that we're building, two remedies, one based on your right of equity and redemption as a tenant and the other in your right of, of claim, your, your deed of right, your deed of claim that can also be used by um, separating your land from their system. So there are two options there and they can follow each other but I've put both there for you because there will be different circumstances where either of those will be beneficial. Tonight and for the remainder of this call, for the remainder of the 20 or so minutes that I have to share this with you, and thank you for those that are listening to this uh, monologue tonight in, in replacement to the call that was scheduled for tonight. I'm going to go through some of the key points that you will see yourself if you take the time to read the history of the land. And I want to go through this and I want to highlight the relevance that this is when we start dealing with the kind of remedies that you can consider for your own situation. So if I click on Tyra land, for example, I see that uh, there is a history and a provenance into the naming of land. Land was not always called land. It was called different things. And if we go back to the origin of private property, we find that the, one of the earliest names for land was Tara or Torah. Now, some of you would, would immediately recognize the sound of that word corresponds to the sound of the first five books of the Bible. And you'd be correct because those first five books had an original editor in the name of the prophet Jeremiah. And even though history has wiped where he went and what he did so that anyone that raises what I'm about to raise is normally considered a kook, there is a long-standing history that after the execution of all but one of the family members of the King Zedekiah of the uh, last of the Messiah kings of the Yahud, or the Davids, the, the Davids as they were called, that Jeremiah convinced the Babylonians to permit Princess Tamar Tefi and the standards to be returned to Ireland, to the Holly, to the green gods. Now, if you think that is absurd, Think about this. Think about holy. Where do we see the word holy in holy? Holy see, holy Roman Empire, holy at Christmas, holy rude, holy wood. It's all around the history of the holy. It's just that you do not see the provenance. They've taken that away. So what I say to you may initially sound odd because you can't see it in the history book. But the sign of the holy is everywhere in the modern world, everywhere, and they honour it still today. So Tara Torah being the origin of the land and the origin of property, we see, was the word air. Well, air has the same sound, A-I-R, not that the holy had uh, a language at the time, air is the same as in Latin, air, H-E-R-E-S, or air, H-E-I-R. So we see a provenance and a history of these words. But under the holly, 
thousands of years ago. The most important concept associated with property, the right of use, was the right of possession. That when one had the right of possession, they could not lawfully be uh, removed. And so what this system allowed was instead of a, a system of chaos where I could come and take your home or you could come and take my home or a group of us could come and take a whole range of homes, people respected possession. They believed in the concept of possession. This is not a physical law. This is not a law of physics. This is an agreement, an understanding, a fundamental element of civilization that we would be civil to one another by respecting one another's right of possession. And so possession is and has been an essential component, not just of property, but of organized living for thousands of years. And when they say possession is nine tenths of the law, it is true. Now, when we move forward to uh, another concept, and I'm, as I say, in the time allowed, I'm just going to go through some of these. We click on la land. Now, la probably sounds a bit funny, but when we say la, we mean la or la res. The customs of Pax Romana, the Roman Empire, SPQR. We find that even when the Romans created their concept of conquest and the word occupation, they still honoured the ancient principle of possession. But what the Romans did was that they made a distinction now between possession and ownership. And what the Romans argued was possession was no longer proof entirely of ownership. Instead, they created in their registers the idea that if, if a land had been conquered and therefore occupied, that the register was proof of ownership. And so they permitted amongst their citizens the right of ownership of conquered land, of occupied land, providing it was registered and providing that land was not sacred. That land was not the site of a temple or recognised as being a sacred site. Now, if any Roman citizen in a conquered territory, a province, was to claim, occupy a sacred site. This was considered such a grave offence, they would be executed, they would lose their estates and their families would be sold into perpetual slavery. This is a 2,200 year old rule. A sacred site is to be respected regardless of the religion and regardless of whether the population has been subjugated and conquered and now occupied. Now, the Romans, we are told, were great at a great many things, and one is claimed that they were great at property. They weren't great at property. They were great at control. They were great at property as we deal with it as goods, but they were hopeless with land management. How do we know this? Because throughout the history of the Roman Empire, when we go back through Gibbon's history of the Roman Empire, we see time and time again the Roman Empire faced collapse because of famine. Well, the environment wasn't against the Romans. It's just that the Romans didn't care much for organised, fair management of the land. And how do we know this? Because the Romans created a concept in conquered territories of a thing called usufruct. Usus fructus. Use and fructus or fructus from which we get fruit. So usus fructus was a legal concept created by the Romans which basically said that one could take and use the fruits of the land of another, owned by another. Now this meant certainly from the point of view of the slave, the peasant and the tribe that they could continue to live as they needed to live on land that was now considered occupied and owned by the Romans in conquered territory. But it also went the other way. It meant that the Roman legions, as they marched through to crush and control some uprising of freedom, could strip the fields, 
could strip the trees, could claim what they needed, and it would be lawful. And this is the pragmatic control of the Roman system. And usufruct still exists today. Although we don't know it as usufruct, it's known as eminent domain. Now, when the Romans wished to survey, unlike the ancient principle of survey, known as terrain under the holly, the Romans didn't survey the land. They surveyed their roles. They surveyed their registers. And when they surveyed their registers, it was called a census. So the distinction between possession, which remains the fundamental principle of land, the concept of occupation was first in best dressed, in conquered land, and being in a register, a valid entry in a register for occupation. But if that occupation was of sacred land, it was forbidden, absolutely forbidden. Now think about it. Is your land, is your home not sacred? Do you not consider the home that you've worked for and slaved for and fought for not a sacred place? What does information mean when you go out and you do a proper survey of your land and prepare the material for your land? This is an insight and an important insight because even the system today is based on that principle of sacred land is forbidden to be occupied and claimed. Well, moving forward, we then talk about the Franks and the emergence of the Frankish Empire at the uh, 8th century. And they are the ones that created the concept of the tenancy, the tenant. Now, when I've mentioned to you before in previous calls, I've said that when you look at a mortgage, you are a tenant. When they deny that, you can simply say, do I hold legal title? No. Well, if I don't hold legal title, what do I hold? I hold equitable title. If I hold equitable title, I must be a tenant. So they can't get away with the lie of saying you're not a tenant. Of course you are a tenant under a mortgage. You will always be a tenant. You will never own the land. So it, the concept of tenant and tenancy was created by the Franks. Now, the Franks were the role model of the great Christian knight. And when the Franks created their empire, they created it because they considered Byzantine to have been corrupt and that they believed in the words of the New Testament and they believed that the world should be according to laws of honour and faith and charity and they were going to make sure that land rights were in accordance with that. They were realigning rights back to partially what the Torah, the Torah had taught and eliminating the injustices of the Roman system. So the tenancy was important because under tenancy, they created two rights that have never been severed from a tenancy. Two rights that cannot be severed from a tenancy because they were considered sacred and immutable. And they are the right of equity and the right of redemption, the rights of equity and the rights of redemption. Now, what is the right of equity? Well, the right of equity, which turned into the right of chancery, is that if a tenant has the right of use of the property and the tenant has the right to use that property without interference by the landlord and the tenant has the right of use, and if there is a dispute, the tenant could go to the placitum, or the placitium, being the court formed by the Pippins, by the Franks, and plead their case. And that the landlord had a duty under a tenancy. The landlord had a duty. The landlord could not abandon their rights. The tenant and the landlord were tied together in a matter of honour. Now, the right of redemption was that if the tenant fell behind or, or, or could not pay or could not service what their obligations were, 
and so fell into dishonor.